Good evening. Um, thank you very much for coming to this event today. Uh, we are very happy to welcome the two generals from Japan and the United States, General David Petraeus and General Koichi Sobe, for the important topic of the changing geopolitical landscape in Asia, um, U.S.-Japan alliance today. But without further ado, I think I should um, first start with introducing the two generals on stage today. I think this is a very interesting and important and different event than the type of event on U.S.-Japan relations that we tend to have, that we have two army generals on stage. I think U.S.-Japan alliance tend to be uh, spoken about more um, in terms of the naval relationship. I think that tends to be the focus, but I think it's actually very unusual to have um, the army general and the ground self-defense force general. And also just the fact to have two uniform um, former uniform generals on stage for this kind of matter is kind of unusual too. So um, I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves, but I, I do have a list of their accomplishments that I have to go through, so I think I'd like to um, do a lot of that on their behalf. Um, so General David Petraeus is one of the most prominent U.S. military figures of the post-9-11 era and has been described as one of the great battle captains in U.S. military history. Um, following his military service, he served as the director of CIA and is now a partner with the global investment firm KKR and chairman of the KKR Global Institute. Um, during his 37-year career in the U.S. Army, General Petraeus was widely recognized for his oversight, uh, over, oversight of the organization that produced the U.S. Army's counterinsurgency manual and overhaul all aspects of preparing leaders and units for deployment to combat and for his leadership in the surge in Iraq and for his command of coalition forces in Afghanistan. Um, he, he culminated his military career with six consecutive commands as general officer, five of which were in combat, a record believed amassed in the post-World War II era. Um, general Petraeus is a graduate with distinction from the U.S. Military Academy and a top graduate of his command and general staff college class. Um, and General Petraeus also earned a Ph.D in an interdisciplinary program of international relations and economics from Princeton University's Whitlow Wilson School. He taught economics and international relations at the US United States Military Academy and after leaving government, he was visiting professor of public policy for three and a half years at the City University of New York's Macaulay Honors College. He is also a member of the board of Optiv, a global <coughs> provider of cybersecurity services a Judge Whitney professor at the University of Southern California and a senior fellow at Harvard University's Belfort Center. General Petraeus has been awarded numerous U.S. military, State Department, NATO, and United Nations medals, including four awards of the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, the Bronze Star Medal for Valor, uh, the Command Action, Combat Action Badge, the Ranger Tab, and Master Parachutist Wings. He has also been decorated by 13 foreign countries, and I was going to ask, does that include Japan or not uh, yet? Sadly, no. I, oh, I mean, so I'm, not yet then. <laughs> now that you mention it, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so let me now turn to General Koichi Sobe. I'm available, though. Okay, I, I think somebody <laughs> might take note of that. <laughs> uh, General Isobe retired from active duty in August 2015 after 35 years of service in the Japan Self-Defense Force. He currently serves as strategic advisor to Kawasaki Heavy Industries, and he also serves as senior fellows of Harvard University Asian Center and Asia Pacific Initiative Foundation, and currently resides in Massachusetts. Um, he was commander Eastern Army in his final two years of service. Um, Eastern Army's area of responsibility covers the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and 10 prefectures and almost half of the Japanese total population and GDP. During his tenure, he deployed more than 100,000 self-defense force personnel in three big disasters, October 2013's typhoon flood landslide in Izu Oshima Island, February 2014th record-breaking snowfall in the Kanto region, and September 2014's volcanic eruption at Mount Ontake. So as you know, Japan has lots of natural disasters. Um, unique among ground self-defense force general officers, General Isobe experienced joint staff senior positions twice, director of J-5 and vice chief of staff. He served as a linchpin of U.S.-Japan military coordination via Operation Tomodachi during the Great East Earthquake, uh, Great East Japan Earthquake of March 2011 while serving as J-5. J-5, and for those of you who's not familiar with the military jargon, what is J-5? Is that Joint Staff J-5 proposes strategies, plans, and policy recommendations to the Chief of Staff to the Joint Staff. 
to support his provision of best military advice to the prime minister. So that means that his role was very important. <laughs> I think um, very smart, actually. That's where all yes. the smart guys oh, go. Oh, that's where all the smart goes. Thank you for <coughs> the... <laughs> so, and as, as Vice Chief of St Chief Joint Staff, he initiated amphibious warfare study forum among the Self-Defense self Force three service senior leaders. Um, General Isobe was born in 1958 in Korea City, Hiroshima Prefecture, and was raised in Tokushima Prefecture. He attended the National Defense Academy and was commissioned as a second lieutenant of the Ground Self-Defense Force in 1981. He was a helicopter aviator who flew OH-6 and CH-47. After graduation from Command and General Staff College Ground Self-Defense Forces, he served at Japan U.S. Security Affairs Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he also served at various staff appointments in the General Staff Office, GSFDF. His command positions included 9th Division Aviation Squadron and 7th Armored Division and Eastern Army. General Isobe earned a Master's of Military Studies at U.S. Marine Corps University. Um, one thing that I'd like to ask you to highlight later why it's the Marine Corps. And, and he earned, where his master's paper on the modality of the U.S.-Japan alliance earned the Brigadier A. W. Hammett Award. Um, he also received his master's of, science in the, uh, master's of Science in the National Resource Strategy at the National Defense University, Fort McNair in 2003. General Isobe's awards include the Legion of Merit and the Meritorious Service Medal. Those are both U.S. awards. U.S. Yes. awards, so things should be reciprocal. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually a pretty big deal again. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so please um, allow me to add a word and to um, highlight the aspects of their career that means most to me personally. They're profiles as social scho soldier scholars. Um, previous to my appointment at Columbia University, I taught for 18 years at the National Defense Academy in Japan. Um, and during that time, I taught classes on civil military relations and U.S. foreign policy and referred to General Petraeus as an example of soldier scholar. So you can imagine how nervous I am sitting next to him right now. It's almost <laughs> surreal that I'm meeting him in person. And another officer I frequently refer to as an example of soldier scholar was General Isobe, a graduate of the academy whom I had the privilege of knowing for almost 20 years. Alongside his studies at the USMC University at the National Defense Academy, General Isobe has written important forward-looking articles on the self-defense force roles and missions, including when he was still captain at the um, Command and Staff General College. Um, and not all my former students follow my advice to become a soldier scholar like the two generals here, but um, there's one um, soldier scholar in the making that I'm, I'm happy to introduce you today. I'm putting on this spot, but Major Hoshino, who is sitting right there, um, he's currently an exchange officer, foreign exchange officer and instructor at the US uh, Military Academy at West Point. Fantastic. And I'd like to em emphasize that point because, well, one, I'm, I'm terribly proud of him right now, and also I think it shows the level of trust there is between the US and Japan. They would actually have a foreign officer from Japan to train and teach the cadets at your academy. So just for that, I'd like to highlight that. And Thank you. sorry for going on for so long. Now I'd like to turn to General Petraeus. And I think I'd like to start with what kind of, um, what have you done in relationship uh, with Japan, either during your career in the Army and also, now I understand that um, Ambassador Reichiro Takahashi, mm -hmm. who a lot of us know from his three years as Consul General in mm -hmm. New York, you worked with him in Afghanistan. I did. Uh, he was so, a terrific partner in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. And really, the reason I spent so much time with him then, and by the way, when I was in New York uh, during this time as the Consul General, uh, was because Japan was the number two contributor mm -hmm. when it came to financial support for Afghanistan, a country that desperately needed and still needs all the support it could get. Uh, and one that, unlike Iraq, which could generate $100, million, or $100 billion in oil revenue as long as the pipelines weren't blown up, um, it could not do that. And it very, very much depended on that assistance. And Japan, together with the U.S., uh, really led the way in that regard. And he was a terrific partner. I should note that in uh, Iraq, um, I also uh, had a close partnership with the Japanese diplomatic corps there. Uh, some of you may recall, tragically, that two Japanese diplomats were killed uh, on a road north of Baghdad uh, fairly early on. And this is when I was a two-star general uh, in northern Iraq uh, with our headquarters in Mosul, uh, and they were driving up to meet me. And uh, every time I go back to Japan, 
and go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is just about every time I go back, uh, I always take time to pause and to visit the tree that's been planted in their honor that is very uh, unobtrusive, a very small little marker. Uh, but those two individuals gave their lives uh, for what it was that our two countries were seeking to do together in a very troubled part of the world. <clears throat> I should also note, uh, I really do feel privileged to be here with you this evening. The reason I am here, candidly, uh, is because of the uh, admiration that I've had for your country. Um, I, in my post-government time during my now coming up on six years of KKR, that's three times as long as any job I ever held in the military or at the CIA, um, we have done a great deal uh, in Japan. We have a very active office there. We plan to deploy some $3 billion of the $9.3 billion that we raised a year or so ago in the largest Asia investment fund uh, in history, and we did the same with the previous fund as well. Uh, we have very close relations there. As I mentioned to you backstage, I always visit with the various leaders, the national security advisor, the foreign minister, the defense minister, if they're not changing quite as constantly as they did for a while. <clears throat> Periodically, uh, the, the prime minister uh, and also the chief cabinet secretary, for whom I know your husband uh, worked as well, which is a great way for a political scientist to get insights uh, into how government operates. Um, I have always had an enormous, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, admiration for Japan. There is something that is very, very special about it. Uh, nothing captures it better than the de description that I heard from a, a very close friend who said that Japan is a country in which if something is worth doing, it's worth doing perfectly. Uh, and that really, I, do, I think, does capture uh, the situation there. Uh, I also am delighted to be here in a somewhat non-standard uh, panel, as you noted, two retired generals. Um, in fact, I was talking to my wife on the way over here, uh, and she mentioned that, yes, she had been to the Japan Society, and it was when they had an art exhibit uh, on cats in Japanese uh, art. Uh, so you couldn't find a more different uh, event than this one right here. Um, again, Japan is a country, I think, that is accurate to say that punches way above its weight class in a number of different arenas. Uh, certainly that would be when it comes to a variety of diplomatic activities, to financial assistance, uh, and, and, and a variety of humanitarian assistance uh, donations that it makes with very, very high quality uh, diplomats, military, uh, and other government officials. Uh, and again, it, it has been uh, a real joy uh, to have quite a bit of interaction uh, with them as, again, when I was in uniform, when I was at the CIA, uh, now at KKR, and even in some of the academic endeavors. As I mentioned, one of the last times I was there, it was as a professor at USC, mm -hmm. University of Southern California, uh, which has a very, very close partnership uh, with uh, institutions in Japan. So again, a privilege to be here and thanks to all of you for turning out on a brisk evening here in New York. And I'm glad that we are supposedly, a, it's a sellout, yes. not that I'm competitive or anything, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, if it's yeah. worth doing, you know, it's of worth course. doing perfectly. Yes, it's worth doing perfectly. Um, and General Silva, it's already clear from my introduction that your career has intersected in yes. many ways with the U.S., but would you please elaborate yes. on experience here? Uh, th thank you, Hikotani-sensei, and uh, thank you, Japan Society, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious occasion. And um, let me begin with, the, with uh, introducing you about the relation between uh, Japan Grants Advance Force and General Petraeus. Uh, after two years of the 9-11, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi uh, decided to send a uh, ground sub defense force contingent to Iraq for humanitarian assistance mission. <coughs> at that time, I was a uh, director of the policy and programs division at the ground staff office. It's a headquarter of the Jap uh, ground sub defense force. And the General Petraeus was the commanding general at that time of the multinational uh, security uh, control. Transition so, Command Iraq. Yeah. That was the three-star command, yes. um, which was essentially the training equipment. Yes. It was in a massive mission. 
involved over $10 billion, I think, in just one year alone. But, it, yes. but, it, but again, a very, very significant undertaking, trying to rebuild all of the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior forces of all types, which would ultimately yes. total nearly a mil million individuals. And at that time, uh, my colleague uh, went to Iraq to meet you. And uh, at that time, uh, you committed the tremendous support to the Japanese Ground Air Defense Force. So actually, in this occasion, I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to you, uh, what you have done during the uh, Iraqi operation. Well, again, the appreciation was ours, truly. Uh, again, it, Japan had a lot of reasons and that it could have hid behind uh, and said, well, we'd really like to help, yes. but you know, sorry, our constitution mm -hmm. or our this or our that. And uh, that was never the case. Yes. And uh, we're very grateful to you for that. And after that, uh, uh, in Japan, uh, 19, uh, 2011, uh, we had a very huge tragedy, uh, March 11th earthquake in eastern Japan. At that time, I was on a director <coughs> J5 joint staff. So at that time, the US Pacific Commander uh, Admiral Willard, uh, he initiated the Operation Tomodachi. And it's a robust uh, uh, support to the uh, Japan. And also, the, we have a triple disasters, tsunami, earthquake, and Fukushima nuclear disasters. So both forces uh, decided to establish a robust uh, uh, coordination mechanism in Tokyo, Japan. So the exercise, uh, the operation uh, conducted very successfully. So this is the Operation Tomodachi. And uh, my one of the research theme uh, in Harvard is the Operation Tomodachi and the US-Japan uh, coordination mechanism. Uh, I'd like to uh, explore how the modality of the US-Japan the coordination mechanisms should be. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, the, the key to that candidly was just the nature of the relationship, number one. Uh, second, the nature of the relationship between the two presidents, uh, the president and the prime minister. Yes. Uh, and third, a very rapid decision in Washington, which is not always known for rapid decisions. Uh, but if you get the big idea right, uh, as in that case, which is we are going to help, and you military and state mm. and agency for international development and all the others, you figure out how to do that. Uh, that's pretty important. Um, you know, it brings to mind a little bit George H.W. Bush stating when he heard, when he was briefed uh, by his advisors on the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and he merely said, this will not stand. And everybody said, oh, okay, I got it. And by the way, there had been a lot of debate. Not everybody in uniform by any means uh, wanted to actually deploy and deal with this. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, Getting the big idea right, getting the guidance right from the very, very top uh, sure can cut through a lot, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, in practice and as you know as a scholar of civil military relations. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, prob we'll get back to the alliance issue, but uh, first I need to widen the sure. topic a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about the current state of geopolitical mm -hmm. landscape in Asia. And I'd like to flip the order and ask General Isobe first. You have, I think you all have this PowerPoint. Page yes. with you, and, and so would you start explaining using Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that General Petraeus uh, would uh, introduce uh, his views very broadly, so I would like to focus on the Northeast Asia surrounding Japan's uh, situation. So I think Japan has uh, three challenges right now. One is a traditional geopolitical challenge. Second is a new emerging challenge. And the third is recurring challenge. Please look at the first slide. The, more, the most prominent feature of Japan's geography is that Japan occupies a 2,200 mile arc-shaped island chain off the east coast of the Eurasian continent. The Japanese archipelago is strategically situated in the position that controls, exits, toward the Pacific Ocean from the continental powers. Based on this geostrategic feature, historically, Japan has always paid attention to three strategic fronts. The North, the Korean Peninsula, 
and the southwestern islands. Since the Meiji Restoration, Japan's strategy has focused on one strategic front, while others are holding. Japan has been interacting with neighboring countries using a bilateral relationship. However, since the 2010s, all three fronts have become increasingly tense simultaneously. Japan has never experienced such a situation before. On the other hand, in the US, the 2017 US national security strategy describes four countries as revisionist powers or rogue states, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Uniquely among the hotspots of the world, three of those exist in Northeast Asia. And those three countries are Japan's neighbors. The drastic geostrategic change in this region is occurring in conjunction with economic development. Japan has been facing challenges and provocations from those countries simultaneously. This is the first recognition of the regional security environment, namely traditional geopolitics has come back in the region. And the second slide shows that uh, new emerging threats like uh, non-traditional domains like uh, cyberspace and outer space. These threats have specific features, invisible, borderless instance, grave impact on daily social life. The Japanese government's cyber security strategy notes, quote, serious impacts may occur not only for governmental bodies and critical infrastructure operators, but for other businesses and even individuals, unquote. And the third challenge is the recurring challenge, diverse natural disasters such as heavy rainfall, typhoons, earthquakes, tsunami, volcanic eruptions. Statistics show that the 20% of worldwide earthquakes with 6.0 Richter or above occur in Japan and 7% of active volcanoes of the world exist in Japan. Response to these natural disasters is one of the major roles of the self-defense force. And the third slide, this is the recognition of the people in Japan in the backside. The latest public opinion survey of 2011 marks the highest 86 point which means 86% of the responders thinks that Japan might be involved in an armed conflict in the future. During the 20th century, such concern had been around 50, but has gradually increased to 80% or more in the 21st century. Okay, so this is my uh, overview. Thank you. So, um, General Petraeus, it seems like, um, as General Isobe mentioned, we've entered or re-entered the era of great power competition. And quite obviously, for the region, um, China is a defining issue. So, are we destined for war, as Graham Allison's book title suggests, or and is the game totally over? That is there no chance to engage China to be active member of rules-based international order, there seems to be, being up at Columbia too, that there is much more pessimism than anything else about China. What is your view about the future of great power competition, especially with regards to China? Well, having had Graham Allison as my mentor at Harvard, <laughs> where I'm a senior fellow, have been for some six years now or so, uh, an enormous admiration for him, and interviewed him on the stage of the 92nd Street Y on his book, which is titled Destined for War, as you said, with no question mark, uh, dash, dash, can China and the United States avoid the Thucydides trap, which is a description of uh, using Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, where he talks about Sparta as the established power, i.e. US, uh, Athens is a rising power, China, uh, and he writes, inevitably they went to war. And, and clearly, look, it cannot be inevitably that they go to war because we are in a nuclear age. Even though some, very recently Bob Kaplan, who wrote about the, quote, new Cold War in foreign policy uh, in the last week or so, uh, identified a whole variety of ways that you can go to war uh, without really threatening, I think, the nuclear threshold. Uh, cyberspace is certainly uh, among those. Um, look, I think, first of all, to back up and just ask, how would you describe the overarching situation 
uh, in East Asia and really in now what is termed the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, which is a good, very good title, I think. And by the way, having been in India last week, I can uh, tell you that it is, I think, very, very apt because the importance of India in this region <coughs> overall is becoming greater and greater. But as a general statement up front, I think it's very accurate to say that the situation uh, in East Asia is increasingly complex and increasingly challenging. Uh, the single biggest development is obviously the rise of China. And let me just state right now, by the way, that I am one who hopes that China and the United States uh, can establish a mutually beneficial relationship, uh, one that is advantageous to both sides. It's not a zero-sum game constantly, although there will always be aspects of competition uh, in which clearly there will be winners and there will be losers. But one hopes that there can be the kind of uh, strategic dialogue that can indeed uh, avoid the Thucydides trap uh, that can avoid a situation where there seems to be a destination that is war. Uh, and I was just in China for a week in uh, mid-December, uh, and I have enormous admiration for what China has done. Indeed, no country in history has ever achieved what they did in the 40-year period that they are now celebrating uh, since Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China, uh, opened the China to the world, uh, and which is now actually captured as only Chinese can do in an industrial strength fashion in their national museum, which has been completely redone mm -hmm. to show the 40 years of progress. And it is frankly quite breathtaking. Indeed, there's a period in there of 20 years where they had year on year double digit GDP growth uh, with maybe one exception in that 20 year period. This is again, completely unprecedented. Um, and I would contend that there is not just a, a geopolitical competition that is going on between the United States and China, again, one which I hope can be mutually beneficial. Uh, it's even bigger than that. This is a true political economic competition because just as in a sense we competed with the Soviet Union, uh, the democracies of the world, the free market economics against the Soviet Communist Party and command economy, uh, and as was captured in a, an article that then became a book, The End of History in 1989 by Francis Fukuyama, um, he predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse of its own weight. It did. He became famous. The little journal that he wrote in National Interest, which had only 10,000 subscribers at the time, I was one, I was in an academic phase in grad school, um, you know, got a huge boost. And by the way, I am now working on a project again at Harvard uh, that is titled The Return of History. Uh, because again, this is not just about, again, traditional great power rivalries. This is about systems. And by the way, their system's doing pretty darn well at a time when the democracies of the world are almost all, with one major exception, Japan, beset by populism, uh, sometimes ultranationalism, and a variety of forces that are causing huge challenges. Uh, you look at the UK with Brexit, France with the yellow, uh, yellow vests, uh, Italy with a right-wing, left-wing government only agrees on one thing, no more refugees. Germany, whose chancellor by all rights should have breezed to victory, had a very close call and was only very narrowly able to put together a coalition to retain her job despite the country doing mm -hmm. magnificently in every regard except for her decision to take in a million uh, refugees, mm -hmm. uh, Spain with a minority government, etc., and the U.S. with, uh, again, a degree of populism uh, in our own country as well. So that's the overarching strategic situation in which Japan finds itself, uh, and Japan, of course, has this unique situation that the U.S. has as well, where their biggest geopolitical rival, clearly China, uh, is also at least one of the biggest, if not their biggest, trading partner. And, of course, the same is true of the United States, something that certainly wasn't the case when the U.S. was engaged in a Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union. Now, beyond that, though, of course, there are a variety of other challenges. North Korea is developing nuclear and missile capabilities. I was actually in Japan the first time a missile sailed over uh, the island to the north. Um, it was quite a big deal. Uh, all my meetings for that day got rescheduled, needless to say. 
Um, and of course, there are disputes that continue, unfortunately, because we would, you know, the U U.S. in particular would love to see our two allies in Northeast Asia, South Korea and Japan, reconcile and work together and share intelligence and all the rest of this instead of uh, prolonged squabbling and differences over situations some 70 years ago. And then, of course, there's a dispute with Russia. Uh, over who owns the islands and so forth. Um, so again, there are a number of challenges, and I think it's very important also just, again, to be forthright and to acknowledge as well that there's one other challenge that Japan has to deal with, which is a demographic downturn that some have actually titled a, a demographic death spiral. Um, and this is a big deal. Um, on the one hand, of course, policies have enabled Japan to stay relatively homogeneous, although there is now some uh, acknowledgement that they're going to have to allow people to come in from the outside. Uh, but this is a very, very significant issue because, of course, the foundation of all national power starts with the economic base. Uh, and it's very, very difficult uh, if your working force is shrinking. By the way, China is losing 5 million people out of their workforce every year, but Japan is already losing people out of its overall population. Uh, it's the one country in the world where the rise of the robots will really be welcomed. Uh, and they'll be happy to have people displaced by robots so that they can go do other things that only people can do. But this is the very complex, I think, environment uh, in which China finds itself. Uh, and that's before digging into some of the other issues that the general alluded to, again, in cyberspace, uh, the issues of some of the other countries uh, in, in the region, uh, that are rising powers, if you will, as well. The shifts of uh, uh, economic, different economic forces that are uh, all brought to bear there uh, in East Asia. And I think it calls for very, very uh, careful and thoughtful and you know, bright J5s of the world and, and others. And I should note, uh, just perhaps when closing on this segment, that uh, those in the U.S. who are very attuned to this kind of stuff are very appreciative of China reinterpret or of, uh, of Japan reinterpreting its constitution to allow true actions that an ally should if you're together and your other ally is shot at that you could actually return on behalf of that ally that is not a trivial issue uh, for those of us who have served in uniform mm -hmm. thank you so general Isobe, so um, what about Japan and the challenge from China, which is very multifaceted? Yes. And it's always often, it's often said that Japan has a very good friend in the US, who's relatively far, but you can't really move right out of the region, <laughs> having been next to China. I think your map that you distributed um, shows where Japan is positioned and what Japan has to deal with geographically. Mm. But it's not just that. There's all the other type of challenges. It's very different from the traditional Montreal challenge. So how has Japan been dealing with um, this challenge or the geopolitical challenge? And what mm. aspect of it is in relationship with the U.S.-Japan alliance that you see has been happening in the past couple of years? Yes. Uh, when I first read through the U.S. national security strategy of uh, 2017, December, uh, released. And I was astonished that the, the strategy clearly describes China as a revisionist power. I think this is the first time for the US security strategy to describe China as a revisionist power. So quite, I think- Quite a forthright admission, I think, actually. Yes. Um, but I think it also reflected not just this administration, mm -hmm. not just that party, mm -hmm. but I think a bipartisan yes. mm -hmm. uh, recognition uh, that some of the hopeful assumptions that we had about the rise of China would have not actually materialized. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, a big, again, a very, very big deal yes. in the biggest relationship in the world. And uh, Hikotani has mentioned that the Japan is situated in a a uh, very strategic important position. The shield of the, for the US security, Japanese location is like a shield to stop the advancement of the continental powers. And for the China, Japan is an, a 
very important position and also uh, trading partners. So as mentioned, uh, General Petraeus mentioned that the new Cold War, but actually it is not a Cold War because uh, both three countries are trading uh, mutually. So what kind of a relation should be a explore for us is very important. But on, on the contrary, I think uh, for China, uh, they would like to drive a wedge between the alliance relationship between the US and Japan. But uh, I think uh, the US and Japan's alliance, solid alliance, would eventually uh, change the China's attitude in the international or liberal world order. Thank you. Um, so going forward and dealing with or thinking about the challenges in the region, I think one of the very common things that we see between US and Japan is the increased use of the term Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Um, PACOM was renamed Indo-PACOM in, in May 30th. Um, and, but even before that, Prime Minister Abe, even from his first term in office, has been um, um, talking about the more focus on the Indo-Pacific and the confluence of the two seas. Um, so what do you see, um, First General Petraeus, is there, when, although um, President Trump mentioned Indo-Pacific, I think 10 times during his speech in November 2017, um, in some ways, from countries in Asia, we don't really feel the love from the U.S. to its allies either. And so what do you think is the vision of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy for the U.S. going forward, or what's the meat on the bone? To what, if I can say, of the Indo-Pacific strategy that especially has to do with allies. What is the vision of the U.S. going sure. forward? Um, first of all, let me just start by just noting that the Japanese military, the self-defense forces, are very, very capable. I think people can be misled by the fact that you know, I haven't been in war and that to specifically have limits uh, and so forth that are obviously very historic in nature. Uh, but one should not be fooled into thinking that this is not a very, very capable, highly professional, and very advanced technology force. Uh, so it's very, very significant. Um, and China is very attuned uh, to what Japan does. Uh, just the, the uh, transformation of one of the um, amphibious carriers uh, into what could be a true aircraft carrier albeit probably with a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, because I can't imagine the deck's going to be long enough. But again, even that raised eyebrows and produced commentary uh, in Beijing. So China watches Japan very clearly and carefully, and I think is very aware of the capabilities that Japan deploys, uh, particularly at sea and, and in the air, All very good ground forces. But again, that is a, a, a maritime theater uh, with air capabilities. So that's, that's I think, um, number one to, to point out. Um, the second is that I think it's, it's important to observe that Prime Minister Abe, I mean, he was very astute in establishing a relationship with uh, President Trump very early on. As I recall, he was the first one in Trump Tower uh, to greet the president-elect. He was, I think, the first down in uh, did one of those uh, summits down in Mar-a-Lago. Um, every time I have talked to Japanese leaders, they've been very, very pleased with the relationship that they have uh, with their U.S. counterparts. Um, everything that was done by Secretary Tillerson at the time, now his successor Pompeo, uh, General McMaster, uh, again, the relationships between the counterparts were superb. And... Um, I should note that the U.S. ambassador, uh, with whom I have a very close relationship uh, and had a bit of correspondence and some phone calls recently on some other issues, actually mentioned how pleased he was. I had talked, happened to talk to him fairly early on, and he was asking me, how do you accelerate uh, foreign military sales, which can be a very frustrating process. And I experienced it firsthand when we were trying to build, again, the Iraqi security forces using our system which has a lot of bureaucratic hurdles uh, to get over. Uh, and I said, you know, if I were in your shoes and you know the incumbent in the Oval Office pretty well, 
Um, I would call him and I'd say you want him at the top to, again, the big idea, we are going to support our Japanese allies, period, and then make the Pentagon and State Department really accelerate with the normal processes. That is happening. And again, among the biggest levers that the U.S. has to get attention of North Korea, which is really by getting attention of China, through which 90% of the trade to and from the North flows, uh, is by Japan saying that they will put in, say, the theater high-altitude air defense system, or they will put in a ground version of some other, uh, or, I mean, you know, the ultimate threat that is out there uh, is that a country which has enormous nuclear uh, technology expertise because of the nuclear power generation that do is done in Japan and is now gradually being restarted throughout the country, um, that that could lead to something in the military realm. I'm mm -hmm. not at all advocating that or suggesting that, but just the thought of that uh, is enough, I think, to get attention uh, in places to the West. And again, rest assured, I want to see all these relationships be, again, mm -hmm. beneficial and positive for all engaged. But sometimes to get to that, you have to show that you are firm, mm -hmm. not provocative. Uh, and I think there that you know, history is already asking if perhaps we weren't too hopeful at times in the fairly recent past and could have been firmer as certain activities were pursued that now are facts on the ground or facts at sea um, mm -hmm. in the South and East China Seas, for example, um, that, that could have been answered more decisively in the beginning and might have perhaps avoided the situation in which we now find ourselves. So now beyond that, by the way, now you see this relationship flourishing or beginning. I flourish would be an overstatement, but between the real pillars of the Indo-Pacific are India, Australia, Japan, and the other Pacific power, the United States. Um, and so if you get those four together, and then if you could put the others around it, mm -hmm. um, I think you'd have a very, very impressive uh, group uh, again, recognizing that India, of course, has a different history. It was a non-aligned. It was still buys weapons and so forth systems from Russia, uh, in some cases, unfortunately. Um, and so this will be a work in progress that will take some time. And there are elections coming up in, in India, in Australia, uh, and at some point, I guess, in, in Japan as well. And hopefully we can navigate all of those uh, reasonably well also. Um, so, generally, so about this idea of Indo-Pacific, I think um, the Japanese government description of the Indo-Pacific tends to focus more on the economic connectivity and not necessarily on the security aspects, aside from the capacity building and the rule-based order, which is indirectly related. So, what are what is your I, take? I on don't that? know if I would agree with that. If I you could, think? just okay. to, I mean, I actually, again, having just been an in Indian, okay. having just talked with the commander who used to be commander of PACOM, U.S. PACOM, mm -hmm. now. U.S. indo right. um, and uh, had a good chat with the Admiral there and the Australian Foreign Minister and a number of Indians. I, I think there's quite a significant security component uh, already uh, to the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. But I hope so, you would support yeah. me on that. <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, my early days, but... My, my observation is that, that among the alliances partners in the Indo-Pacific region for the United States, Japan is increasingly important for the U.S. security uh, because the following reasons. One is uh, US, the U.S. and Japan shares the common core values like democracy, freedom of navigation, freedom of expressions. And the second is the, as I mentioned, Japan is situated in a very critically important position. And the third is Japan is still a number third uh, world economy power. So, so I think no other countries, allies in the Indo-Pacific region can replace or substitute Japan for the United States. Oh, I agree with yeah. that very much so. And again, it would be nice to have some others in that. Yes. I mean, you can literally think about this, uh, think about the first island chain, if yes. you will, as it's described, and the countries that comprise it. 
Think about some of the countries of Southeast Asia, which are, be, are very, very vibrant. I mm -hmm. mean, look at what's happening as uh, low-skilled labor jobs move from China to Southeast Asia, Vietnam in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Thailand, a historic partner, and a number of other countries there. Um, so there's a lot that could come together. Mm -hmm. um, the key, in my view, uh, really, is to have an American foreign policy to begin it that is coherent and comprehensive. Mm -hmm. uh, coherent means that you have... <laughs> <laughs> this is another project at Harvard, actually. <laughs> um, but if you think about it, uh, again, if the big idea is, gosh, we're, I guess it was in, again, India, where somebody asked a question and the answerer said, China, China, China. I mean, if the most important relationship in the world, mm -hmm. and it clearly is, is between the U.S. and China, mm -hmm. clearly that has to become your priority. As you know, in a military, you can only have one main effort, uh, and the others are all, by definition, therefore, supporting efforts. Uh, so if you then, but then it has to be comprehensive, and it can't just be uh, diplomatic or just military or just economic or just whatever. Um, it has to be all of the above, and all of them have to be seeking to achieve the same policy objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not sure that in all cases that we have done that. I mean, a perfect example of this is, despite the valid concerns about some elements of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and recognizing that both candidates ultimately, Hillary Clinton ultimately had to come out against it as well, obviously for domestic political reasons, having sold it for four years when I was in uniform and at the CIA. Um, but to withdraw from that um, was a very, very significant step uh, and one that is back from the kind of coherence that you would want uh, if you are going to confront another country whose actions in various respects have led to a bipartisan consensus in the United States writ large, not just in inside the Beltway in Washington, uh, but writ large that there are unacceptable activities going on that need to be uh, answered and need dialogue and need to be resolved when it comes to uh, tariff and non-tariff trade barriers, when it comes to actions in the South China Sea, actions relative uh, to North Korea, um, theft of intellectual property, um, forced transfer. I mean, again, there's a whole host of these and again, I think it's now very commonly recognized. And I think, frankly, that our Chinese partners recognize that they have crossed some lines with the United States um, that you know, they should have wished that they didn't do because it has now provoked, mm -hmm. I think, this backlash. Mm -hmm. And again, as one, we're all very active in China as well. Uh, and i out there several times a year, enormous admiration for what they've done but again, this is now quite a substantial issue and it's beyond just the sheer trade, early stages of a trade war, which presumably many of which uh, elements can be resolved. It's about the bigger issues uh, that we're talking about that do have to be uh, resolved. And again, if you're going to go at this in a coherent fashion, you want the G7 countries with you, uh, you, you, want the, you want NATO with you, you want all the countries, again, of Trans-Pacific Partnership with you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think it, we do need at times to look at have we prioritized what it is we're doing mm -hmm. and are we pursuing this? Uh, and then, you know, you also have to have uh, a little bit of a disciplined communication strategy, as you might say, as well. Right. Right. That, um, yes, that discipline is very difficult, I guess, at this point point in time for the it's current administration. It's always difficult. Uh, it's always it's difficult. A little bit more <laughs> challenged right now. Right. <laughs> but um, so going forward, um, I'm going to sort of go into some questions that I've um, sure. received from the audience. But there was a question raised about, um, to both of you, is there anything that you're worried about, the U.S.-Japan relationship or the alliance, if I talk about the, um, um, the, the, um, the military side of things? Because um, you mentioned, General Sobe, that the, there's a perception that there's a higher likelihood of a perception that the danger of war has gone up. Um, um, I actually checked the figures and it's gone up um, by 10% from 75 to, to 85 um, in the past three years. 
And, and, and in order to deal with that, um, that um, the best way to keep Japan safe, the most Japanese people still answer, it's the US-Japan alliance, that's 81.9%, but it's gone down slightly in the past three years. Um, and whether or not the US-Japan alliance is useful has gone down slightly <laughs> as well. And on, on, the, on the other hand, what's interesting about um, the Chicago Council on Foreign Affairs uh, um, poll that was conducted December 2018 is that despite um, the policy changes that of the US and maybe less interest in engaging abroad, the, um, the public opinion polls there show that um, the Americans view the U.S.-Japan relationship as an important one for the U.S. economy by 91% and for the U.S. security at 79%. And they would actually support defending Japan against North Korean attack, 64% um, um, in its favor, but not as much for um, in a Japan-China conflict over disputed islands. So that's kind of the tricky one. But overall, so I think it's very hard to find a bilateral relationship in which the public seems to be very supportive of the alliance and the choice to rely on the alliance for its security. And having said that still, is there something, going back to this question, that worries you going forward, whether it's a gap or a difference in the preferences going forward into what the ideal situation might be, or is it more of an operational issue that has to be addressed to more effectively do things um, together going forward? So. So, for example, in securing the defense of Japan, mm -hmm. I think uh, Japan should uh, increase their defense budget. And actually, uh, last December, uh, this December, uh, the government adopted the new uh, national defense program guidelines. Maybe you are not so familiar with that. Uh, this is like a um, national defense strategy and the military strategy. Uh, not exactly the same, but such a uh, doctrine uh, was adopted. And in that doctrine, uh, the three key points is a seamless response. And the second is the whole of government approach. And in the military, militarily cross domain uh, concept. So these uh, defense effort in Japan uh, would eventually uh, strengthen the alliance because the defense of Japan improvement uh, would help mm -hmm. the U.S. Uh, security, national security. I think so. Um, so, General Petrus, if I can let, plug let in another, yeah, take please. that if I could, because I think there are some specific issues that um, need to be addressed more expeditiously, frankly. One of them is in the trade area. We have trade disputes with Japan, uh, as you well know. I mean, these are date way back to the 1980s when, you remember, there were limits, Japan instituted limits on cars. They were always way above however many actually really went anyway, but it was a wonderfully symbolic uh, response. Um, but there are disagreements here. We can't let this stuff divide us. And uh, I'm reassured to a degree because the White House has alerted the Congress, notified them that they will be negotiating not just with the EU and the UK, but also with Japan, uh, having already refined the Korea-US trade agreement, then getting agreement on the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. So I think that's actually very important because that could, again, that could drive some wedges uh, between our two countries. Uh, I share some of the concerns about, in a sense, the domestic sentiment um, about the spending on the Japanese self-defense forces. I also am very concerned, uh, this is a long-standing concern of the last decade or more, uh, about the U.S. base uh, in Okinawa, which we're trying to relocate uh, desperately. Um, and continue to have very serious problems. This is not a trivial issue. And tragically, we've had acts of indiscipline by some of the uh, members of the forces based there or rotating through there that have really inflamed this particular situation. Um, and then I guess, you know, there's, we've always been a bit concerned that uh, Prime Minister Abe would have to deploy so much political capital to get the reinterpretation of the Constitution or perhaps even a constitutional change that it wouldn't leave enough for the other very important domestic issues that he has to deal with, uh, principally those that have to do with continuing the success of Abenomics. Because if you think about it, Japan was in the doldrums for 20 years. 
Uh, we forget, you know, the, the high-flying 1980s when all of us, again, in economics courses were wondering why the U.S. didn't have a METI, the Ministry of Industry and whatever it was, an in industry, industrial policy. And we had some very sage professors at Princeton, thankfully, who said, you know, ultimately you're going to see that government bureaucrats are not going to be as good as market forces at allocating resources. And ultimately they did prove correct. So what and then you had 20 years of really just stagnant growth. And uh, Abenomics has broken through that. Uh, we'd like to think that some of you know, the US investors are part of this because we're helping to, at his request to, to work on board dynamics and, and management philosophy and all the rest of this. So trying to retain the best features of the Japanese corporate culture while getting rid of some of those that are just holding it back. Uh, and it's been a very interesting uh, experience in that regard. But he's got some big issues still. I mean, the debt to GDP ratio is not a trivial issue. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, all the issues of how do you fine tune the additional taxation uh, without sending the economy into a tailspin? Um, how, what do you do about other stimulus uh, mechanisms? Um, this is a very finely balanced set of policies that he's pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're concerned that, again, you use up too much political capital here, you might not have it there, uh, because he, has, he and his government have truly been critical uh, to what is a really an economic renaissance uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of Japan. Right. Well, let, me, let me point out two, two points. Uh, one is that uh, uh, after the... Uh, the national defense program guideline based on this, uh, the Japanese government uh, are going to purchase many US weapon systems. Yes, like you bet. Sure, and F-35A yep. and Bs. And by the way, these yeah. get the attention of those regional countries. Yes. And the second issue is the Okinawa uh, base issues. Uh, I think the Nai Armitage report, fourth one, uh, released uh, last year, I think November, and they propose that the co-location of both U.S. forces and Japanese self-defense forces located together, <laughs> and uh, it is, I think, good way to maintain the bases, facilities in Okinawa. I hope so. Touch wood. <laughs> Inshallah. As they say in my other region. Right, you <laughs> um, So coming back to military issues, well, I might as well because I have two sure. journals on stage. Uh, what are, and, and bringing in the questions from the audience, how can the U.S. repair cooperate to address potential threats from North Korea? And especially given that um, mm. the relationship between Japan and South Korea is kind of tricky these days, uh, sure. what are the areas in which there's things that we can think about? Together, there was another question so with regards to... Let me actually to, just yes. start with that because yes. you never want to stack up questions with old guys. We might forget the first <laughs> one. Um, I alluded to this a bit earlier, but the effort to uh, get North Korea to stop the missile testing, stop the nuclear testing, and then ultimately to take the other actions that can lead to, uh, what do they call it, it's, it's full and irreversible and verifiable denuclearization. Um, the only way to do this was to get the attention of China. And this is why you had some of the rhetoric, uh, not all of which would have been my choice of words at various times, uh, but to get the attention again of China that the US is truly considering the use of force uh, if North Korea doesn't come to its senses because it's unacceptable uh, what it was that they were doing. Uh, and at the end of the day, China has the power, uh, if it truly implements the sanctions fully uh, that are called for approved by the UN Security Council, noting again that it's well over 90% of the, what, you know, this is what keeps the lights on in Pyongyang, is the umbilical cord that runs between China and North Korea. So how else do you get China's attention? Well, you know, you put a THAAD system theater high altitude air defense system uh, into what used to be a golf course in, in Seoul. And that got uh, China's attention. You put Aegis ashore. This is an air defense system 
that's usually on ships, but now there's a shore version of it as well. You put a THAAD system into Japan. You uh, increase other capabilities. The F-35, the most advanced uh, fighter bomber in the world, uh, again, in the hands of very sophisticated professional military, uh, in this case, pilots and airmen. Uh, that's how you uh, get the word across that this is really something that the region, as well as the United States, are taking very, very seriously. How about you, General Isoga, about the North Korean? Yeah, the Korean uh, I think North Korea, Kim Jong Un is now gaining time to continue develop uh, nuclear weapons and uh, ballistic missiles. <coughs> so for Japan, denuclearization of uh, Korean Peninsula is very important, yeah. critical. But also for Japan, intermediate ballistic missiles threat still remains. So I think, I believe that the extended deterrence posture uh, provided by the US is very important. And for Japan, we should uh, strengthen or improve the credibility of the extended deterrence. Um, so another question, this is to General Petraeus. Um, over the last year or two, it looks like the U.S. armed forces are withdrawing from abroad. What's your view on this, and what would be the potential reaction from regional actors worldwide? You know, it, until a month ago, or whenever it was that the announcement was made that we were going to withdraw from Syria and reduce our forces in Afghanistan, um, I would have said absolutely not true. Uh, in fact, this is an, I, my caution, particularly to overseas audiences, is always, yes, read the tweets, but then follow the troops, follow the money, and follow the policy. And so, for example, if you look at NATO, uh, very heavily criticized by this president, by the way, also by other presidents, not quite as directly uh, as this president has, but I've, I've sat through NATO meetings as a NATO commander, as a three and a four star, uh, where whether it was the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the U.S. presidents of both parties, uh, again, railing on about the fact that NATO's not spending enough. And the fact is that we are spending more twice what all of our NATO allies spend together. Having said that, if you then follow the troops and you note that U.S. forces have gone into the Baltic states, uh, there's the U.S. Armor Brigade back on European soil for the first time. Uh, there are U.S. fighters out in eastern Poland. Uh, there are new NATO commands being established to push the forces out there and to control the maritime uh, approaches to Europe once again, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these a continuation of the previous administration's policies, but frankly also an augmentation because when you spend $720 billion on defense, your overall military readiness obviously improves dramatically whether it's for NATO or for something in the Indo-Pacific or even in, in the Middle East. Um, in fact, this administration uh, in its early months decided to augment our forces in Iraq uh, and in Syria uh, and in Afghanistan in ways that I thought were very appropriate, were not outrageous in terms of what they we were. They were very sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure, which is necessary if you're doing something that requires a sustained commitment. Uh, Decision-making authority was pushed down to levels uh, below it, th those at which they were previously. And there are some of the restrictions on air power that a lot of us had questioned for some time uh, were removed as well, noting again that the previous administration made steps in that mm -hmm. regard as well. Um, and again, then you look at what was done in, in uh, the Pacific region, again, largely a continuation mm -hmm. of what the previous uh, administration did with the so-called rebalance to Asia or the quote popularly known as the pivot to Asia, which none of us like because a pivot implies you're pivoting away from something else from the Middle East to uh, the East Asia, um, whereas really you're staying engaged here and you're uh, just getting further engaged there. Um, so I would have actually countered that until these recent announcements. The challenge now is we really don't have clarity on what the true policy is mm -hmm. um, in Syria, uh, the policy objectives which we thought were clear when enunciated by National Security Advisor Bolton and Ambassador Jeffrey, the uh, special envoy <coughs> for Syria and now also for the uh, counter-ISIS coalition, 
Um, just we have to see what they are going to be if, if they're redefined and what will the pace of the drawdown be and, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and then does it make sense? Um, how can you square a circle uh, if in Afghanistan you already have a fraught security situation, and if you acknowledge that we went there for a reason, it's where the 9-11 attacks were planned, when Al-Qaeda had a sanctuary under the Taliban, we stayed uh, for a reason uh, to ensure that it stays eliminated. Um, and we've now done it in a way that, again, I would contend is sustainable, which is crucial, and by the way, involves a very substantial uh, level of assistance from Japan, uh, which again, I'm certain is probably still the number two uh, contributor uh, to the financial assistance uh, for our Afghan partners. So um, I think I, we have time for one last question, which should be to both of you. Um, some have argued that Japan should be included in the five eyes, uh, mm -hmm. which is intelligence sharing, which is at this point US, UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Uh, what are the challenges for Japan to be a member, and what, do you, what is your view from the U.S. side about potentially stepping, putting Japan included? Yes. Well, uh, Five Eyes, if Japan is welcomed to the Five Eyes countries, members, uh, I think we should have a much more sec secured information uh, protection <laughs> measures. <laughs> Yeah. How about you, General? Well, I think it's very clear. I mean, again, there are very significant technical mm -hmm. standards that have to be applied. Um, I think the general would probably acknowledge that China has prided itself on its openness, not its closedness. And when you are sharing very sensitive uh, information about sources, i.e. human beings, um, or what is it derived from them, and methods, particularly, again, in a variety of different technical realms of signals and cyber and, and space and so forth, um, you've got to be sure that the handling measures um, are absolutely routine uh, for that organization. I'm not saying that there is not classified information uh, in the Japanese system. I am saying I think it's accurate, because you've seen both systems, mm. uh, and undoubtedly, we're, we're I'm sure you were given at least a U.S. secret clearance at some of your times in the U.S., um, that there are not quite the same procedural uh, aspects to the safeguarding of classified information. But again, I, I ask for your confirmation or denial. Please. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, um, so I guess on a very military note, <laughs> that might be um, appropriate. But we're, I'm very happy that we actually talked about a much wider range of issues than maybe the audience might have expected from two generals on stage. So I have to thank you for that. Um, please join me in thanking uh, General Patayas and General Vesoga. Thank, thank you. Thank you.